Tonight, storm battered. Two killed as ravaging typhoon Krathen crashes into southwestern Taiwan, bringing the island to a standstill. Grappling power, an unsealed case alleged the Republican candidate Donald Trump to have resorted to crimes after losing the 2020 election. Blow to blow, massive blast in Beirut after Israel renews airstrikes on Lebanon. And a mesmerizing space, a ring of fire dazzled after Easter Island and Pentagonia as solar eclipse shines in an annual spectacle. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ada Derna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Aquil Qureshi. Good evening and welcome down to World News Tonight, where we've got quite a lot of updates to bring to you from around the world. Let's begin in Taiwan. The 18th typhoon of the season, Typhoon Krathon, made landfall in southwestern Taiwan and despite being weakened, winds exceeded 140 kilometers per hour and damage was widespread. Cargo containers loaded at a port in Taiwan were being tossed around like fallen leaves. Shop windows were completely torn off, unable to withstand the powerful winds brought by Typhoon Kraton. The 18th typhoon of the season, Kraton, made landfall in Kaohsiung City in southwestern Taiwan on Thursday. Despite the typhoon weakening upon landfall, winds of up to 140 kilometers per hour slammed the island, damaging power lines and causing 100,000 households to lose power. Schools and workplaces were closed all over the island, while domestic flights were also suspended. More than 10,000 residents were forced to evacuate. The Taiwanese authorities say at least two people are dead, while 210 people were injured. One person is reported missing. The slow-moving typhoon is causing more damage to the affected areas, while causing flooding in some parts of Kaohsiung. However, the typhoon is forecast to move northward and weaken further into a tropical depression by Friday, bringing rain to neighboring countries, including here in South Korea. The Kaohsiung local government has been especially careful in its disaster preparations after Typhoon Thelma killed 37 people in 1977. Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba formally instructed his ministers to compile a fresh economic package to cushion the blow to households from rising living costs. Ishiba decisions comes off as a new government makes an exit from the deflation its top priority. The step comes as Ishiba, previously seen as a proponent of fiscal austerity, now stresses ahead of a general election that his focus is to get the economy to fully shake off the deflation that has weighed it down for the last three decades. Ishiba told Parliament in a policy speech that they would need to support people suffering from rising costs right now until a positive growth cycle with wage increases, outpacing inflation and driving capital expenditures is established. Earlier, the newly appointed Prime Minister told his cabinet a supplementary budget would be compiled to fund the package after lower house elections set for October 27th. The fresh package will include payouts to low-income households and subsidies to local governments. On the diplomacy front, Ishiba vowed to keep building ties with like-minded nations, including deeper security cooperation with neighboring South Korea, pursued by his predecessor. He also said he would work with China where possible while confronting it on issues of disagreement. Ukraine says it struck a Russian radar station using American long-range ballistic missiles while not specifying when the strike took place. While the war continued, the new NATO chief made a trip to Kyiv, during which he reaffirmed support for Ukraine. The Ukrainian military said on Thursday that it used U.S. Army Tactical Missile System, or Atacom's ballistic missiles, to strike a Russian Nebo-M radar station. The Nebo-M radar is a system that can detect fifth-generation aircraft, like the F-22 and F-35, as well as long-range ballistic missile launches. Ukraine's military says it believes Russia had 10 such operational systems left. The military did not state any details of the strike, including when it had taken place, but said that the destruction of the Nebo-M radar creates a favorable air corridor for the effective use of missile weapons. The long-range Atacom's missiles Ukraine used were sent by the United States in the spring, when Ukraine at the time had committed to only use the weapons inside its own territory, which is also the case with the British Storm Shadow. 
In the past months, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has been urging Western allies to let Ukraine fire their supplied long-range missiles deep into Russia. Washington has not suggested any change in its position of not lifting restrictions. Meanwhile, NATO's new Secretary General Mark Rutte, who took office on October 1st, vowed in his first speech in the Post to help reinforce Western support for war-ravaged Ukraine. And just 48 hours after taking over NATO leadership, Rutte made an unannounced visit to Kiev, where he pressured Western countries to lift their restrictions on Ukraine's use of advanced weapons to defend their country. This comes ahead of a crucial meeting of Ukraine supporting leaders, set to be led by U.S. President Joe Biden on October 12th. Rutte added he could work with whoever is elected president of the United States in November. Six migrants died after Mexican soldiers fired on a group of migrant travelers in pickup trucks. The vehicle carrying the passengers had tried to evade a military patrol underlying tensions on Mexico's southern border as it faces U.S. pressure to contain migration. Mexican soldiers fired on a truck carrying migrants near the Guatemalan border Tuesday, killing six and injuring several others. That's according to Mexico's defense ministry, which said the group had tried to evade a military patrol. It comes as Mexico's southern border continues to face U.S. pressure to contain migration. The ministry said the truck was followed by two vehicles similar to those used by criminal groups in the area. Soldiers reported hearing explosions, after which two officers opened fire. The group included people of Egyptian, Nepalese, Cuban, Indian and Pakistani nationality, 33 in all. The ministry did not specify the nationalities of the dead. The ministry said the soldiers who fired were removed from their posts and that federal prosecutors have been informed. A military tribunal will also carry out its own investigation. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now. Prosecutors have laid out new evidence against Donald Trump. They're accusing him of laying the groundwork to the overturn of the 2020 election even before he lost. The filing details Trump's actions on January 6 when thousands of supporters stormed the Capitol as Congress was certifying the election. It also focuses on Trump's alleged interactions with then-Vice President Mike Pence, who would refuse Trump's insistence he stop it. The defendant told him that hundreds of thousands of people are going to hate your guts and people are going to think you're stupid and berated him pointedly, you're too honest. When told Pence's life was in danger at the Capitol, the filing claims Trump responded by saying, so what? The filing also alleges Trump allies sought to create chaos, including one unnamed Trump supporter shortly after the election encouraging protests even to make them riot. The document says at least nine times Pence tried to convince Trump to give up his fight, saying he could run again next time. Trump allegedly replied, 2024 is so far off. The federal civil rights trial against three former Memphis police officers charged with violations surrounding the beating death of Tyree Nichols has concluded with a jury reaching a mixed verdict. It's a case that outraged the nation. Tyree Nichols, seen in disturbing video, brutally beaten by Memphis police officers and ultimately pummeled to death early last year. Oh, watch out, watch out. Watch out. Oh. And tonight, three of those former officers, Tadarius Bean, Demetrius Haley, and Justin Smith, each have been found guilty in the federal civil rights trial. During the nearly month-long federal trial, two other officers who were also part of the now disbanded Scorpion unit meant to patrol high crime hotspots, taking the stand and testifying against their fellow squad members. Stop. Nichols kicked, punched, tased and pepper sprayed by the officers. At one point, begging for his life, crying out for his mother who lived just one block away. The 29-year-old father critically injured, dying three days later. Bringing you the latest on the Middle Eastern crisis now. Fighting between Hezbollah's militants and Israeli troops is intensifying as more IDF soldiers move into Lebanon after fresh Israeli airstrikes pound Beirut. 
The attack comes after Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said Iran will pay for its missile attack earlier this week on the nation. More Israeli troops are marching into Lebanon. This is footage of a reserve unit operating across the border as Israel's military widened evacuation orders, likely signaling expanded air and ground attacks. Israeli jets struck again in Hezbollah's stronghold in southern Beirut and overnight an attack closer to the city center left at least nine people dead. Lebanon's health minister said attacks by Israel have killed more than 1,000 Lebanese in the past two weeks alone and nearly 2,000 over the past year. Israel's losses are also beginning to mount with another soldier killed Thursday and eight killed the day before with others needing an emergency medical evacuation after a reported Hezbollah ambush. The Iran-backed militia has also intensified its rocket attacks on northern Israel. Hi, are you Angela? Yeah. I'm Chris, nice to meet you. Israel says its war goal is to enable people like Angela Yantian and more than 60,000 other Israeli evacuees to safely return to their homes. Her community in Baram, located just 300 meters from the border with Lebanon, evacuated on October the 8th. Nearly the entire community lived in a hotel, 500 people. She since had to move four more times, and while inconvenient, she says it's also deeply unsettling to have Israeli soldiers dying in Lebanon. Meanwhile, Joe Biden has said the U.S. is discussing with Israeli the possibilities of Israeli's strike on Iran oil infrastructure. When asked if he would and support such strikes, Mr. Biden made an off-the-cuff remark as he left the White House and did not make clear Washington's stance on the strike. The U.S. is discussing strikes on Iran's oil facilities as retaliation for Tehran's missile attack on Israel. That's according to President Joe Biden on Thursday. Israel is weighing its options after Iran launched its largest ever assault on Tuesday. Biden was asked whether he would support Israel striking Iran's oil facilities. His comments contributed to a surge in global oil prices due to the rising Middle East tensions. The president also emphasized that no immediate action was planned, but reassured that Israel would respond to Iran's aggression. A U.S. official said Washington does not believe Israel has decided yet how to respond to Iran. However, on Wednesday, Biden said he would not support any Israeli strike on Iran's nuclear sites. Meanwhile, Israel continued to target Hezbollah in Lebanon, launching new airstrikes on Beirut. Israel appeared to be targeting Hezbollah strongholds with reports of heavy bombardment in the Dayyer area. Residents say Israel ordered people to leave their homes in parts of the district. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed Iran will pay for Tuesday's missile attack, and Washington said it would work with its longtime ally to ensure Iran faced severe consequences. Iranian President Masoud Pezeshkian, speaking in Doha, said on Thursday that Tehran would be ready to respond. Israel says its operations in Lebanon aim to help tens of thousands of its citizens to return home after areas near its northern border were forced to evacuate by Hezbollah attacks during the Gaza war. Meanwhile, over 1.2 million Lebanese have been displaced, with nearly 2,000 casualties reported since the escalation of Israeli attacks in the past year, primarily in the last two weeks. Meanwhile, the U.S. stock workers and port operations preachers uh, a tentative deal that will immediately end a crippling three-day strike that has shut down shipping on the U.S. East Coast and the Gulf Coast. U.S. dock workers and port operators reached a deal Thursday to end a crippling three-day strike. The stoppage has shut down shipping on the East Coast and Gulf Coast. It's the biggest such walkout in nearly half a century, with analysts putting the cost to the economy at up to $5 billion per day. In all, 36 ports were affected, including New York, Baltimore, and Houston. Now, Reuters sources say the two sides have agreed to a pay hike of 62% over six years. The United States Maritime Alliance group of employers had previously offered close to 50%. In a statement, the union and port operators said they would now go back to the bargaining table to hammer out the remaining details. Among the key issues that remain is automation, which workers say will lead to job losses. International Longshoremen's Association boss Harold Daggett wants cargo shippers to stop projects that threaten employment. He says shipping lines like Maersk have refused to heed the demand. Now, a deal to end the strike will be a relief for President Joe Biden. He had sided with the dockers, calling on the shipping industry to share the bumper profits it's made in recent years. 
Biden had resisted calls from business groups and Republican lawmakers to use federal powers to end the stoppages, which they said threatened chaos for consumers. The strike has left at least 45 container vessels waiting to unload and came just as southeastern states were struggling for supplies following a deadly hurricane. On Thursday, the White House convened a virtual meeting of shipping line bosses, pressing them to agree to a quick deal following the storm. By midday, the shippers had agreed to make an improved pay offer. Some diplomatics updates now. The United Kingdom announced that it is giving up its sovereignty over the Chagos Island back to Mauritius. The historic move will allow displaced residents to return home after decades. The United Kingdom on Thursday announced that it is giving up sovereignty over the Chagos Islands back to the Mauritius in a historic move that will allow displaced residents to return home after decades. The deal, which the UK and Mauritius announced jointly, will include the tropical atoll of Diego Garcia, currently used by the US government as a military base. While Mauritius has full sovereignty over the archipelago, Britain will be authorized to exercise rights over the Diego Garcia, guaranteeing the operation of the US base for the next 99 years. The British Foreign Minister David Lamy said in a statement that today's agreement secures this vital military base for the future, adding that it will shut down any possibility of the Indian Ocean being used as a dangerous illegal migration route to the UK. Mark Travis, a doctor accused of giving ketamine to the late French star Matthew Perry, has pleaded guilty to one count of conspiring the distribution of the drug. Perry died in October last year primarily from the effect of ketamine. This morning, one of the doctors charged in the ketamine overdose death of friend star Matthew Perry pleading guilty. Mark Chavez hustled out of a Los Angeles federal courtroom Wednesday after admitting to writing fraudulent ketamine prescriptions for Perry. He's one of five people prosecutors say took part in a broad underground criminal network. These defendants took advantage of Mr. Perry's addiction issues to enrich themselves. Investigators say Perry, who died nearly a year ago, was legally prescribed the powerful anesthetic to treat depression and that he sought out Dr. Chavez and Dr. Salvador Placencia to increase his supply. Prosecutors allege the doctor is at one point charging Perry $55,000 for 20 vials of ketamine, with Dr. Placencia allegedly texting Dr. Chavez. He wrote in a text message in September 2023, quote, I wonder how much this moron will pay. Chavez agreeing to a plea deal in August, surrendering his passport and relinquishing his medical license as he agrees to cooperate with federal investigators. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. And finally tonight, the moon blotted out most of the sun across the Pacific Ocean, giving just a few specks of land an impressive annular ring of fire eclipse. On the eastern islands and the small area near the southern east tip of the Kyle and Argentina witnessed an annular eclipse lasting just a few minutes. It's a rare ring of fire that appears in the sky when the sun, moon and earth become perfectly aligned, but the moon does not block out the sun entirely. The phenomenon only lasts about six minutes and occurs every one to two years. On the southern tip of Argentina in Patagonia, scenes of jubilation and excitement as hundreds of lucky sky gazers braved the icy weather to watch the annular eclipse through dark tinted glasses. And on Chile's Easter Island, tourists and locals eagerly set up their telescopes to get a closer look. The solar eclipse's path started in the North Pacific and finished in the Atlantic, lasting over three hours. A partial eclipse was visible from most of the Latin American countries like Uruguay, Bolivia, Peru and several islands in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. And that brings us to the end of today's bulletin. We'll see you again on Monday with the latest happenings across the globe. Until then, do stay tuned as we've got Sanami Muda Naika joining you next on Nike Business Report. Thank you for watching. I'm a pro and good night.